I'm very prepared, and I just, I just want you to know. I, I have, am excited about you being prepared. I have my three recommendations. Let me get the mic closer. I have my three recommendations. I have my three books that I've recently finished or I'm reading. I put stuff in your Trello board. I mean, like, I don't know who I am. I don't know who you are either, but I'm here for it. Did I talk about that on another show? I had this whole discussion with myself when I was trying to pick out books. I was like, shit, what have I talked about? <laughs> we need to keep a running list because I keep forgetting. We do. We do. Um, I, I try. Uh, let's see. What have I? Also, like, I feel like I've read so many things. And then when I go to pick something for the recently read category, I'm like, yeah, where are the books? <laughs> where are the books? Where did Be they all go? Because we're only talking about one that we're currently reading. I don't know. This is going to be a tight one, isn't it? Did I talk about the Hollywood homicide on one of the episodes? I don't think so. Okay. So that'll be one of my, I just finished reading books. Good grief. Okay. Yikes. I'll think about a... Like, I'm looking around, like, what's going to be my recommendation? I'll figure it out. In your, in your defense, you did reorganize all your books, so. I did, but I don't think that's really the issue. I just forgot about this part. I just it's forgot your, about this wait, part. You're the one who added this part to the whole podcast. I know, and I love <laughs> this part because we're giving more people, we're giving more wrecks to people, and I love that. But, yeah. All right. Okay, I think I've got it for this episode. I forgot the rest for the other two episodes. Woohoo! All right. All right. Well, <clears throat> let me get another sip of tea. <clears throat> get another sip of tea, lady. We can't record forever today because I got a meal prep. Meal prep! It's Sunday. I have prep those meals. Of, a lot of prep. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We're here. I also have, want to finish some books today. Uh, hello! Hello! I too need to finish books. I need to finish To Paradise. Yes, you and do, because we were supposed to talk plow. about that. We can't talk about that because somebody didn't finish the book. I need to finish it. I need to finish the Paradise. I need to finish Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead and Giovanni's Room. So, I'm working on uh, Giovanni's Room, uh, another book, and another book that I'll talk about at some point in one of these episodes. So I got a couple. I got three books. One's almost done, and the other two are short. So. Yeah, I think tonight I'm going to focus on Drive Your Plow and Giovanni's Room, and then tomorrow I'll finish up to Paradise. I yeah. think that's my game plan, so. But we're here today. What are we doing? We're talking about stuff. <laughs> Welcome to a podcast where we talk about stuff. We're going to talk about <laughs> stuff. Come talk about stuff. We're going to talk about, I'm going to fuck with my mic. We're going to talk about the love songs of W-E-D-E-B Du Bois. e d b d b d. The best way we can. The best way we can. So, kick it off with uh, whatever you are currently reading or what you just finished reading uh let's talk about one of the things i am currently reading which you will know if you followed me on mm -hmm. instagram but i've been reading this book uh we ride upon sticks which was the february feminist book club pick and i'm actually angry because they had a discussion yesterday which was the 26th and they have a discussion today which is the 27th and i thought i was going to be off on the first i'm not so that was the discussion oh. i was I was I was aiming for but I'm almost there I'm almost there but basically it's like 1980s awesomeness it's super quirky and the writing is very funny but poignant mm -hmm. and it follows this group this uh girls field hockey team one of whom is a descendant from uh um Anne Putnam from the Salem Witch Trials and her name's Abby Putnam. Anyway, so they end up like making like st delving into the world of witchcraft and Ooh. to become a winning field hockey team. And it's this ragtag bunch of girls. Um, you got all different kinds of walk, uh, all different walks of life, all different people and perspectives. So it it hits, m you know, it's fun and funny and a coming of age story and all those things. But it's also like hard hitting and makes commentary on. Um, race and 
I don't know, being a woman and being queer and they have a they have a a, a guy on the field hockey team because outside of America, mm, there are like a lot of men play field hockey, um, which is funny because I remember we had a, one guy who was from Germany, was gorgeous, by the way, and he played on our field hockey team in mm-hmm. high school and it was, yeah. So I'm like, I'm reading this and I'm like, yeah, it is, it is weird. Like yeah. to everyone else, it's weird because here it's, it's just a girl sport. But anyway, so it's, it's a really fun and interesting um, book. Like they basically make a pact and they write it down in this like Emilio Estevez notebook. <laughs> like there's, it's so funny. It's so funny. And there is no camera that picks up just how neon this cover is. Naomi, you need to read this. I think you would die laughing. Now, that book is not new, right? That's no, been it's out not. For at least a year, correct? At least, yeah. Okay, because that title is very familiar to me. I had never heard of it before, which is why I was so excited that it came in my box, because I was like, I've never heard of this. Let me try it. Yeah, it came out in 2020, so it's been out for like two years. And it's by Quan Berry. And it's it's so good. It's so and funny. I, and I never would have found it if I wasn't, um, you know, an ambassador for a feminist book club. So, I just bought a book by Quan Berry. I, I can't locate it now, but it's interesting that we're talking about her. I don't know what it was. I was like, oh, oh, I need to try this author. This book sounds so interesting. So I ordered that book. But now, like, you're showing me this rewrite upon sticks, and it's just like, oh, ding dong. That's the same. That's the same author. So yeah, I'm excited to give her a a try. Like, that sounds she, so funny and so good. She weeps each time you're born. Is that the one you have? No. She also has a whole bunch of poetry. It's not poetry. According according to this, there may be another book in there since this is from the from 2020. Perhaps she has another book in there. Maybe I'll locate it later and uh, let you know. But that sounds good. That sounds like it's really I like to good. Read. You would really like this. Yeah, that um, sounds great. Anybody who has any relation to the 1980s would enjoy it immensely. <laughs> I love that. All right. So um, a couple weeks ago, I read these two books, books one and two, by this author. Her name is Kelly Garrett, and she has a series called Detective by Day. And the first book is called Hollywood Homicide. And um, I was just in the mood for, like, a cute little mystery, and this really hit the spot. Not only was it based in, you know, California, which is, you know, we're a group in L.A., so things are very familiar. You know, I love that. But I had so much fun with this mystery. So we're following Dana Anderson. She goes by day, and she had kind of hit it big with this, um, this like, chicken place commercial she got really popular she had this really popular saying and um she thought that was going to last a while but they decided to change directions and basically cut her contract so now she's like out of money trying to figure out you know how she's going to like make it in the in the acting world she originally came uh to 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 the area to go to school but ended up landing this you know acting gig but so now she's all out of sorts and her parents house is like uh, gonna be in like foreclosure she's trying to help her parents and she comes across this billboard that's basically like help us solve this murder for this amount of money and she's like ha 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 perhaps I can do that because my friends and I just so happened to be in the line of sight when that particular accident occurred. So this whole story is about her trying to solve this case, trying to get this money, trying to help her parents. And her friends in this book are absolutely hilarious. She has this one friend who was obsessed with making it big in Hollywood. So she goes to all the things. She brings her own little paparazzi with her. It's, She's so fantastic because, like, even when things are written bad about her in the tabloids or in the newspapers or whatever, she just keeps on a kick and she just keeps on a going <laughs> because she has the most positive outlook and she just knows she's going to make it big. And she was a, a true delight. So Dana Anderson was great, but also her group of friends were really sweet and uh, really funny. And I, I read book one and two back to back, and then I mm-hmm. went to Goodreads to see what was next, and then I got... Immediately sad because that's it. There is no book oh, three no. yet. That's the sad part when you run across a fantastic, really feel good series and you realize you've read the only two that are in existence. Oh, that's awful. And also you cut out yeah. a little bit. Are you not on your hardwire? I am. 
Oh, interesting. Maybe it's me. I hope I hope it was you and not me. Did I cut out a lot? I don't know. Just like a second. Okay. Or two. You're fine. So Oh so, the technicalities oh, yeah. of life. Yeah, very much so. So that was really fun. So that's um I know you really enjoyed that series. And it's I such really a bummer. I really did. It's such a bummer when you like really like something that there's just, just that. That's it. You're like, but but this is there author more coming? Has, well well supposedly supposedly I, I i don't i don't know it's a little sketchy on the goodreads but she does have a new like thriller out called like a sister it's one of our libro picks uh this month that's her kelly garrett oh okay so i will definitely read that but i'm really hoping that we get more of this detective by day series i'm just kind of thrown off because goodreads says that book three oh no wait I think there is a book three. It says published in 2019. Okay, never mind. You see so here, I have one Naomi more. has found a third book. She's found it. More. She's excited. I'm surprised she's not buying it right now. I'll be downloading it. So, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's what I finished and loved. Excellent. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about quite a book, huh? Oof, quite a book. Yeah. I mean... Listen, I, I, I had a suspicion of what to expect, but really not much. I had no idea what this book was going to truly be about other than sort of being like an a epic family, family saga. saga. Exactly. And that was it. Exactly. And so, and I kind of liked that because I was like, I just, I just want to go in. I just want to go in and experience it. And this journey... From oh boy. Whew, whew, the beginning to end, it was crazy. So we are talking about this beautiful book right here. The love that I just got tea on. <laughs> Very B. Du Bois about. by Honoré Fanon Jeffers. So it's, this, an, it's an astounding read. It's an astounding debut novel. Right. I know that she is a poet and has collections of poetry, but to. To come out with this almost 800 page saga. Right. That is so meticulously researched and yep. put together and touches on so many things. Yeah. It's is just, it's, I'm always astounded by people and how brilliant they are because like. Tell me about it, right? It's like, you thought of this, this, yeah. this just. Just, just developed in your brain. My brain doesn't develop those things. And the my brain that... makes up songs about Jesus, the moose that works that runs on water. Oh my god! And <laughs> the fact that this almost eight hundred page book, like for me, it did not lag at all. There were no dull points no. in this book for me. This book felt. Um, First of all, it's very readable. That's that's number yes. one. Yes, 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 uh, yes, yes. Number two, I found that it's like um, there's an addictive factor in this book where the way these it, stories are written, you just need to know what's happening next. I, I, You're so invested in everything and everyone, and you just, you almost just can't stop reading. Because she gives you little breadcrumbs throughout. So she's moving back and forth from yes. like, the beginning origins of this family and like what where do we start like the 80s maybe maybe the um 80s. somewhere like that uh with basically the today version of the family and where they are today and you get these breadcrumbs throughout as she's going back and forth and moving throughout the tale so you know that something happens with the sister which you don't know what it is right but then you get another piece of this piece of the puzzle and then you circle back at some point and it's never confusing. It's like she ends it at just the right spots to keep you going. Hmm. And yeah. then she'll move to the next chunk of characters. Cause it's a lot to, to discuss yes. all of these people yeah, and it not make it laborious. Of people. I appreciated yeah. her, uh, lovely family tree because you need it. You do. You, you, you really need it. Um, so that's really helpful because there's a lot going on here. A lot going on. Yeah. And I love how it starts with uh, the native peoples. 
so that was very interesting, right? How mm -hmm. we're talking about we're talking about black, black people, slave era, but also Native Americans and Native land, and mm -hmm. how those two things play together, and how m most of us are on stolen land. Yes. I don't think I've ever read a story that talks about slavery and stolen Native land before. I don't think I have either. And I would like to see more of that. Yeah. I'm sure it exists. I just haven't come across it just yet. Yeah, because and, how can we not talk about those two things? They're, yeah. they're totally in relation to one well, another. It's not, and it's not just that. And then, and then you get into the slavery piece of the narrative. And you see how intertwined the... You know, first you have the, the blacks and then you have this like black native white mixing going on. Yeah. And how that keeps playing a role throughout. Yes. And it's like, how are any of us different? Right? Right. Like it. Right. It just so clearly shows how incorrect those sentiments are were and still are for some people yeah for sure she has this um do i want to read this whole passage it was really good though i'm upset that i didn't mark mine up because i listened to it a lot predominantly i listened to it so i didn't have the book always at hand so yeah that's I'm like something. mad i didn't mark it up because there were so many beautiful passages and moments and Oh, trust me. I did not mark this up the way I wanted to. So for anyone who's thinking about reading this book, just know that this story is so captivating and the writing is truly so beautiful. If you have mm -hmm. a goal to annotate and tab the book, it gets very hard because you get swept away by the story. And that's what yeah. happened to me several times like I had to go back and like rewind the audiobook so many times because I was like mm -hmm. oh wait I might want to capture that but for a good chunk of this book I was just so swept up I just completely and I'm talking I always like hold a, a pen in my hand when I want to annotate with the cap off like ready to write mm -hmm. and even with that I was still so swept up it's like yeah. I forgot the pen was even in my hand yeah so just know if you have a desire to annotate this book this story really grabs a hold of you. <laughs> you need to be very aware. You really do. You really, really do. So I almost feel like at some point I'm going to read it again. Just I think to there's really things I missed. Up. Yeah. For sure. Because there's so much. Because it, sure. it doesn't just intertwine the family, but it intertwines big pieces and chunks of you know, African-American history right. in this country. But some and, books are like that, right? The, the, right? Yeah. You read it one time just for the pure, like, yeah. let me just enjoy this read, right? And yeah. then you read it again for, okay, well, let me look, dig a little deeper into the text of it. And I think that's mm -hmm. what this book is. Read it one time just to enjoy it. And yeah. then read it again for your annotation purposes. Yeah. It's so good. And I did not expect there to be, going into it, I did not expect it to be so much about passing. That was a shocker for me, too. That was... That was the, th I was like, wow, wow, holy shit. That was and I had no idea too. there was a whole, like, black enclave on Martha's Vineyard. Because to be honest with you, if I think Martha's Vineyard, I just think preppy white people. Now that I didn't know. And I only know that because I know so many people, family and friends from generations of gener that have stick their claim on Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. And also it was something um, to aspire to. So mm -hmm. that little piece I knew. But yeah. That passing thing was kind of strong in this book. And I was like, wow, we're oh, yeah. circling right back around the passing, don't we? We do. We can't, we can't escape it. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's, I mean, it says a lot about how when you try to separate people by something as arbitrary as skin tone, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it doesn't really work. So true. So true. Because it's ridiculous. <laughs> but I did feel, I, and I always feel bad when we read this, this in stories, when there's a family and say like one child's light and the other one's dark. And mm -hmm. there's this sort of shitting on the dark child or yeah. the dark family member or the dark husband or whatever. And it's like, 
stop. <laughs> but I get, I, I get it. But also, th- yeah. why? <laughs> like, I mean, this is definitely something that uh, the black community still struggles with today. Colorism is real. It's real everywhere. Even I mean, if even when you look at Hollywood and you look at the actors or the actresses, let me just focus on the woman for a minute. When you look at the actresses who are really getting a lot of play in Hollywood, really like getting these roles, mm-hmm. they are generally of a fairer skin tone. They're more palatable for the general public, if you will. Yes. Their, yes. their hair texture is not as kinky. So you can even see that playing out um, in, in Hollywood. That's why like when a Viola Davis reaches to the heights that she's gone to was like such a big thing because it's like this darker woman of color just mm-hmm. kicked the door through all of that freaking nonsense. You know, yeah. but yeah, colorism is real. I mean, it's, it's, it's back there with the, what we talked about with the Booker Prize, you know, like something can win a prize because it's just gay enough, you know, it's right. like we want, we want diversity, but palatable diversity. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly true. That's exactly true. It's barf. Right. <laughs> Gag me with a spoon. Anybody who grew up in the 80s knows what that means. Okay. <laughs> I, um... Oh, you know what? It's totally off topic. We're talking about random 80s phrases. They did They did pull a greetings and salutations out, and I was like, yes. Really? If none of you have seen Heather's, what are you waiting for? Anyway, keep going. Oh, that's classic. I know. Anyway, back to, back to the book. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah, I I don't I don't know. Where 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 do we where do we even begin with this? This is the downside when you don't annotate the way you want to. I tried to find us discussion questions and I find it sort of appalling that there are no discussion questions anywhere even from the publisher or from Oprah's book club because Oh, right. That's right. Does says right on my book and Oprah's uh Open Book Club 2021, that's right. I found lots of, like, book clubs that were announcing their discussions, but not any, like, set of study guide or anything like that. And I think that's such a shame, because this is the kind of book yeah. that really It's made for that. discussion, for sure. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't need some guidance. It's so big, and there are so many characters, so in such a large uh, timeline. Yeah. Who's your favorite character, you think? Okay. I've thought about this. I I think I ooh, okay. I asked myself this and I, I keep getting tripped up. So it's a it, it's it's a cross between Ailey and Lydia. That's I think what's the mom's name? You know I'm bad at all names. I know, I know. Belle. Mm-hmm. Or um was it Uncle Root? Oh, he was great too. Like, what a great character! Fantastic character, and uh, and I think what's so wonderful about this book is how real it feels because you have you don't have you have outrageous things that are happening to people, mm-hmm. um, but they're believable in the context of the story and they don't feel like they're, you know, the, 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 any, the author's being, I don't know, hyperbolic or anything like that. Right. And the, it's done really nicely because there's this balance of characters like uncle root who are really like grounding, ah, root. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) And give Ailey direction throughout the story and give her a place to actually find herself as she's struggling with her current family dynamic. Right. Uh, while, and then ultimately learning about her family history. Mm-hmm. So true. He was wonderful. He was absolutely wonderful. He was so wonderful. As soon as and he called her... And the dad was good until a moment. Oh. Well. But even Zulu ends up being... I thought that was really wonderful that Zulu became this person that sort of stuck around and still helped. That's true. You know, giving Lydia a job and yeah, a way to Lydia. survive. Poor Lydia. Like, <sighs> so we, one of the, should, are we spoilers? 
Ooh, yeah. Look, we're talking about this book, folks. So, you know. So one of the big themes throughout the entire book is sexual assault and pedophilia from oh, slave yeah. times to, mm-hmm. <laughs> to present. That, yeah. Um, and it, I mean, one, what does that say about our society that it's so prevalent? Yeah. Even, um, you know, there's this, you know, you can feel like, oh, if you're the, the master and you have control over these people, you know, that somehow explains why it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what's the explanation today? We don't have it. It's that people are sick. People are absolutely sick. That whole section on how a man becomes a monster Mm -hmm. was number one, so terrifying to read Mm -hmm. because, you know, he himself, he was, you know, sexually violated as a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as he grows up, and I was asking myself this question because I wrote a note here, like, when a younger person is violated, is sexually violated in such a manner, I, I, I wonder our, our desires and urges awaken too early and leaving that child in a place where because they're a child, they don't know how to redirect those feelings and because yeah. generally they don't talk about those things or they have no one to confide in because they've been threatened by said predator, they grow up having those feelings um, misdirected, redirected in the wrong, in the wrong path. And then they, put, they potentially go on to do the same that was done to them, but a more in a more exasperated way, I guess, because they never got the healing or the help to deal with the trauma that was inflicted upon them. Yeah, maybe there's definitely something that occurs because there is a commonality between abuse, the abused becoming abuser, but it's yeah. not like a hundred percent. It's not an absolute. Right. But, or is it, is it, there is there a piece of being stunted sort of in your intellectual or like your growth um, psychologically so it's almost like you're stuck at whatever age you were abused and mm-hmm. that's why that's where you're focused because mm. building a house and filling it with a succession of girls at yeah. an age yes for years yep yep is awful and the amount that something like that was hidden but not hidden exactly like if you're hiding it yeah. maybe it's not right there's no perception of right or wrong yeah that's clearly missing but also i wonder you know is that inner child still so present where at any chance that inner child is trying to regain power and control perhaps taking over and abusing someone else. Yeah. I mean, that is kind of a very childlike thing, right? You did something to me, so I'm going to do something to you. Yeah. It's it's a devastating set of chapters. It really is. It's a very devastating set of chapters. I kept sending Naomi messages throughout. Like, yeah, who's this motherfucker? (laughs) Yeah, it's it's a lot to read. There are a lot of things that are hard to read. So uh, we're not big on trigger warnings. Grow up, you're all adults. But um, if you don't like. To read about certain things. This might not be the book for you. I but... mean, look, anytime we're going to look, if we're talking about slavery, then, you know, we're going to talk about the worst things that can happen to a human. So you should already know that going in. 
No one should have to prep you for that. We're not talking about sunshine and butterflies here. It's slavery. Mm. <laughs> it's not coming out of left field. Exactly. I mean, one group of people said, I own you. I can do whatever I want to your body. You're not even human. Right. Enter right. horribleness. Should we talk about Rebecca since we're already, like, kind of there? Fuck Rebecca! Oh, my yes. gosh. <laughs> I fucking hate Rebecca. Oh, but my like, gosh. But, like, some slaves were happy, Naomi. Didn't you know that? I mean, they must have been. I mean, you know, they were they part stayed. of the family. Oh, my God. Where is that part? I've got my to find... mammy. My mammy breastfed me. Okay. I fucking when I read that, I was so like, what is much. happening? I'm so angry. I put my mug down on the table. <laughs> set up oh, on the I soft found spot. it. Okay, so this was on page six twenty, right? So mm-hmm. Rebecca's this white woman, and she's married to a black man. What is his name? What What was her husband's name? Scooter or something stupid like that. I don't remember what his real name is. Yeah. So, so she and Ailey are having this conversation, talking about what they're studying. Uh, for school, because um, this this is this is past the point where Ayla decided that she wanted to go into studying history, and so <laughs> Rebecca says, "I'm interested in doing research on mammies." <laughs> mammies. Uh, Ailey says, "I search for humor in her face or irony, anything. There was nothing." So Rebecca says. See, people talk about how there was so much animosity between masters and slaves, but I want to prove there wasn't. I want to talk about family. I... So, but how many Rebecca's do we have today? Right. <laughs> but let let me continue on so people can yes, get the going. gist keep of going. this, this keep, chapter. Keep, keep, keep telling us all about Rebecca. Right. So then Ellie says, "You mean biracial people?" Rebecca says, "No, I mean slaves. Slaves were family too, living in the house, taking care of their master's children like they were their own. And there were some kind of slaves, although no one was to talk about that. God forbid anyone want to be politically incorrect. A hand in the air, the diamond shining. You know, I was raised by this wonderful black girl, Flo." Aussie? She worked for my family since I was born. Ailey says, how old are you, Rebecca? Rebecca says, 24. Ailey says, wow, Miss Flossie has worked for your family over two decades. That's a really long time for someone to remain a girl. She must use some high-end moisturizer. <laughs> Rebecca says, yes, Flossie's very beautiful and so loving. She fed me from her own breast. So used to say, somebody wrote the Book of Ruth just for us. I just... Rebecca just does not get it. But I have a suspicion that a lot of white people feel that way. Like, but they were a part of the family. They were Oh, no, they for. definitely do. There's definitely a, a chunk of my people uh, that somehow think that there are, there is the, the happy slave narrative is, is a real narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was the position of that time right to kind of portray it as oh no you know they're 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 being taken care of and you know they 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 they're a part of our family and all their needs are provided for and yada 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 i mean that was definitely a narrative at some point meanwhile their bodies are being violated on the regular um their families are being split up uh right yeah yep nope they're happy they have no choice yeah. They have no choice for any other life, but they're happy. Thanks. Right. That was that was just a really. I hated Rebecca <sighs> so much. So then... and like how and you're right. How did this guy? Yeah. Stay married to her. Yeah. Did he listen to this drivel and be like, "Okay, honey." You're right, because like in my note, I'm like, "Okay, so now as a black woman, I'm asking myself, how does this black man marry a white woman with those kind of thoughts?" Like she was she's so not free. shy about him. That's what she was so free and sharing this with Ellie. Obviously, she doesn't see anything wrong with how she thinks. So yeah. I'm sure they've had the conversation before. So that's a whole other set of questions as to why this black man decided that was okay for him to join his life with someone who thinks that way. That is yeah. crazy. But that happens yeah. also all the time. I know. I, I it was a it was and the a other shake thing- your head moment. The other shake my head moment is how, and it happens throughout, is how much 
or how difficult it seems in this book, at least, for the black men in this book to be feminists in any way. Oh, yeah. Even down to Uncle Root. Does it? Uncle Root has the quote where it's like, "A black man will never be a feminist." Oh, he did say that, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And and he's probably the most supportive. And yes. Pushing for and and, and he it's, took and his it's wife's very... last name, didn't he? Mm-hmm. And it's 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 a very weird mix because like these girls are all, you know, alien or sisters are they're all encouraged to get higher education, yeah. to become doctors, yes. get PhDs, to do to do big big, big stuff. things. Yes, as women, and especially I think from their mom because their mom couldn't. Because right. as soon as she got married, she wasn't allowed to go continue to go to school. And besides, that really made me sad. I know. You know, just knowing that she wanted something bigger for herself, and and she had to give it all up because yeah. of the way that of the times. Yeah. And, but still, there's this feeling amongst the men in the book that they can never be feminists because of whatever reason it's just it's so like i'm having i can't seem to process how you can well sort of sort of actually be one but never admit it to yourself because i don't really think they had a full grasp of what it meant to be a feminist that's what i think Mm -hmm. i think that maybe there was some other idea of it or maybe how they saw white women activating as feminists Maybe they weren't, they didn't see that connection as a really. Because those are very, two movement. very different movements. Right. Yeah, so those I are just two very different movements. The, the not having a clear understanding of what that word meant. Because also, too, like, it meant something different for a white woman versus a black woman. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was not like a solid connection of that word to the black community. So I think that's where a lot of their poo-pooing of uh, feminism came in. Yeah. yeah. You know, poo-pooing. But it's like, you're actually doing it. Uncle Root, like, <laughs> like the way that you support, you know, these girls, huge support. Yeah. So, yeah. Miss, Miss but I, I do love the tanking of his wife's name because that was wonderful. So I, re- I remember when I was getting married and people were asking me about whether you could take your husband's name and all this stuff. And truth be told, I didn't really care because as a woman, what is your name? Your name is, my name is my father's name, which yep. was like his father. Like, so what is my name? Like, what does it matter what my name is? And then imagine having, then reading here, I'm like, extrapolate that out. You get taken and you get given a whole new name. So like, what, what is your, what is a name? What does it matter if you take a man or a woman's name? Yeah. It's so funny. The first time I got married, that name thing irritated me a little bit. I didn't want to take my husband's name. Um, his last name wasn't even his father's name. It was it was a former stepfather's name. Mm. So like his mother had like, remarried what at is some name? point. Right. His mother had remarried at some point, and sh- they all took that man's name. But then they divorced like shortly after. So I was like. Number one, that's not even your father's name. But number two, this man is long gone with a whole other family. Like, this is weird. This is just weird. So, you know, whatever. Names, yeah. Names are, what does it matter? Right. Oh, I do do find it interesting when, when a man and woman decide to take both their last names and create a new last name for their family. That's what I... I want I like, to do. I kind of like think, that. I like that. I think that that is the most like egalitarian. Is yeah. that the right word? You know what I mean? That's yeah. kind of the most harmonious. There we go. Probably a better yeah. word. Yeah. Um, way of doing it. Yep. So I, I find Why that really interesting when people name. make that choice. Yeah. Interesting. Because then I that's need your family. So badly. Don't talk for one minute. Okay. This is where I'm going to cut out the audio. Okay. Cut audio back in here. 
I'll try to remember to take that out of the video. <laughs> I try to give you a marker, you know? Naomi, blue nose here. <laughs> because it was just coming. I, I just, it, it was messing up my talking. Why are we so snotty when we record? Anyway. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we, we can't possibly cover everything that's in this book in like a hour long podcast. No, it would be like uh, how we did passing. It would take hours. <laughs> and we would both need to read it again and really like really annotate it the way we wanted to. Yeah. So these are just, you know, glimpses of things that stood out to us when, you know, while reading the book. I think the incest piece is just always so hard for me to digest because it was so much more common. I feel like we make jokes now and it's so taboo and it always kind of was taboo, but it wasn't that taboo. It was like shades of gray. Oh, and then, I mean, clearly Samuel didn't care. Well, you know, but that's a whole different category, but like. Gan Gandhi. 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 You know, but but back then we didn't have all this education information on, you know, molestation. Yeah. And how, you know, most of the time it happens, you know, with someone in the family or a close friend of the family. And so you've yeah. got so many decades of these things happening to young children and family not believing them if they do come forward or blaming oh, yeah. them because because it is such a sick thing to think that an it's... uncle or a grandfather could do that to their own it's almost like your brain can't accept what you just heard it is really so hard to process um this happened with some people i know and it was it was it was devastating because it causes a rift in the family cuz say your un it's your uncle I don't want to spill anybody's beans um but say it's your uncle and you say something years later yeah and now you know there's been decades upon decades of one person one vision in your mind and it's so hard it's so hard. It's like you always hear, but he was such a nice guy. Yeah. You know? So was Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> it's true. You know? When it was you just think evil about, lurking there. That's it. You think about Gandhi because I, as we but get the through threats. the threats. Yeah. But the threats. That's the thing that really got me. It wasn't just... It wasn't just... That he was like, don't tell anybody. It's the way he threatened them. That was so... I mean, that's why Lydia's so fucked up. It's not just the molestation. It's that psychological manipulation. Yeah. And, but like, she was the one that broke of the three of them the most. But the fact that he did that to all, all his girls. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're all struggling and dealing with it in different ways. It was just, mm -hmm. that was devastating as well. It's like, all this happening right under everyone's noses. But he got so much respect because he was a doctor. Yeah. And he was this Stand and that. guy. And also, there's this thing of also, too, and we sort of see it today as well, like not wanting to tear down a black man. Mm -hmm. You know, especially one that's made it to like some kind of, you know, prominence mm -hmm. in, in his life, you know, not wanting to tear down that black man or shatter his identity in any way or or the perception that people have of him as being a stand up, you know, professional, you know, good family guy. You know, I don't know if that's just a black thing, because wasn't there some young kid who got arrested and for assault in like the last couple of years and. The judge was like, oh, I don't want to give them a harsher penalty because this young man has a future ahead of him. And this will, like, if I give him, if I, like, make him a, a sexual predator. I mean, that's a little different. That's just simply you just value white life over everyone else's. You just, you know what I mean? That's yeah. slightly different. But 
It's all terrible, no matter which way you slice it. It's just people need to be held accountable for their actions. They do. They do. But, you know, when it was discovered in the part of the book, like, oh, even Coco, even her. Even Coco. And I was like, mm-hmm. God dang it, Gandhi, you, j- you just. Because Coco's off stage for like. Yeah, she really is. Two thirds of this book. Exactly. Because she's just off. And uh, that's how, I mean, that's how Coco coped. <laughs> Say that 10 times fast. Right. But <laughs> she just escaped. Like, as soon as she could escape, she was like, boom, I'm out of here. Yeah. And I'm, that's going very real, I'm going right? to school. I'm going to school. I'm going to school. Yeah. There's that's a tons very of people. Realistic piece. That's how they cope. That's right. I'm out. I'm leaving Lydia's family, coping. I'm going to do my own thing. Lydia coped in a very common way of coping. They, they, they saw three very different ways of coping. Yep. Ailey was just very, very lost until she met that professor. Yeah. What was her name? Dr. O- oh. Olu. I can't remember everybody's name in this book. There's so many people. Olu Gara. I feel like that's wrong. But, yeah. The Gandhi thing really was devastating. It truly was. So he, you know, just he just caused so much harm. Mm-hmm. So much harm. Yeah, because it's like the Lydia was the first one, right? Yeah. Oh, and wasn't it heartbreaking when Lydia found out that he had even done that to Ailey? Mm-hmm. She was like, "You too." Like I endured this to like protect. Because the eldest feels anyway. like they're protecting. Yeah, right. He's like, "He got you anyway." Like that. That part brought me to tears a little bit as well. Poor Ailey. Poor Ailey. Poor Lydia. Well, poor all of them. But poor yeah. Lydia. I really just feel so bad for Lydia. I must say there were a few parts in this book that actually made me teary eyed. Um, and, and that was, that was one of them. Um, and it's sad how, you know, what happened to these girls is not their fault, Mm -mm. but from Lydia's perspective as, as the older sister, when she has that moment of feeling like she failed her younger Mm -hmm. sister, Oh, that like, that got me. They got me. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's so like, she ends up having a life that's wasted. That she has yeah. a beautiful life that ends up being wasted because of somebody else's evil. Yeah. And that's... Can we talk about Lydia and Dante and the hope that you and I had for oh them? Oh, my God. The and hope I that hate... you and I had for them. She finally finds somebody who understands her. And just because he's, you know, not as educated, he's not that, like, you know, put together great catch he kind of gets vilified and i think it's awful like he's doing the best that he can yeah and he makes some poor choices but he has more goodness in him than some of these other people do that appear to be so good and great yeah he was a really, really good guy. And that moment that they shared where, cause they had, they both had some past sexual trauma and when they confided in one another and shared those harsh truths with one another, it was really a beautiful moment because you can see their fears kind of stripping away mm-hmm. and you can see the connection between them becoming stronger. And I really did see so much hope for them. And that got yeah. stripped away so quickly. I was I was not ready for that. I was not prepared for it to be taken yeah. away so quickly. And I feel so I, so. I just feel so bad for her because she she was hurting so much, and I mean addiction is a disease, and it can be sparked from one moment, yeah, or a handful of moments, and to be. Like, when she finally sees Ailey again and she's scared that Ailey's going to judge her. Yeah. Because that's what the world does. Exactly. They don't see the sickness. They see the addict. And it's it's sad and exactly. depressing and unfortunate. Right. Because most people don't wake up in the morning and go, you know what I want to be today? Right. <laughs> talk about it that's exactly true it's not a life goal (laughs) exactly true people are people are filling emotional holes in them Mm -hmm. because they just want to feel better yeah they want to feel better yeah nobody wants to walk around life feeling dirty 
feeling mm-hmm. full of shame, feeling mm-hmm. angry. Like nobody wants to feel that way. And there are people that find ways to fill that hole that are healthy. Uh, they Maybe they run. There are people who fill it with religion. There right. are people who fill it with all kinds of things. And there are people who fill it with addictions. Right. <laughs> and they're just as valid of people as the, the people that are running around being like, hey, have you found Jesus? That's it. That's it. The, uh, oh, the heartbreak Lydia. of Lydia. I know, right? We're just thinking like, oh, Lydia. Because she too was such a wonderful woman. She was. And had so much potential. She did. I mean, she was doing all the right things until she just couldn't anymore. Yep. Yep. But when you're hiding that big of a secret, you don't get help. But I do think it's interesting that you mirror that with Coco and Melissa. Melissa, right? And they have the shared moment of I don't believe Melissa has had the abuse but Coco has a person that she could confide in right who can support her right can we talk about also too the very hard choice the father had to make in regards to Lydia because I, I, I like this part because it also showed um you know how when someone is addicted to drugs in the family how it really affects the family and so the father basically takes Lydia away. Um, mm-hmm. So he tells her to go upstairs and pack and they get in the car and it says, but in the car, Lydia learned her father had lied to her mother, but he wouldn't lie to Lydia. The insurance wouldn't pay for more rehab and her parents had run through their, through half their savings. He was taking Lydia someplace else and telling mama, her daughter had run away Lydia would have a roof and food, and he'd buy her a bus bus pass every month. He was doing this because he was her daddy. It was his Mm -hmm. job to protect her, but he had to protect his wife as well. Yeah. That's the other part that brought me to tears. Because that's a hard choice. Like, you're lying to your wife, but it is to protect her at the same time. But oh, I already know he's good her. at lying to his wife. Well, yeah, we know that. But but also still ensuring that your your daughter has some level of safety and protection as well. Yeah. And, and his old friend comes and helps too. Yeah. So like I the It's such a beautiful and heartbreaking story. It it really it is. It really is. He says, You can't come back to this house, Lydia. I can't see your mama's heart broken. Not again. I'm not giving you no money either. Whatever shit you want to smoke, you get it on your own. I'm giving your car to Coco. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Mm-hmm. Hard choices. It's hard. Hard choices. Well, because at some point, when does the parent cross over into the enabler? Or the spouse. Or the sibling. Or the whoever. And it's, it, it is a real piece of the issue of addiction and dealing with it. Yeah. Um, There's a spiraling you, that happens right when you're trying to save a child. And so you can't save people that don't want to be saved. Exactly. But you can't just watch someone you love spiral out of control. And become completely consumed by that and that only. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why everybody needs therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't just affect the person. It affects everyone that person touches. Yep. So true. So so true. Yeah. Read the damn book. <laughs> Read the book. Read the book. Are we yeah. wrapping this book up now? I mean, I guess so. We're at about an hour. Do you? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we could talk about this for a really long time, but I think y'all get the gist of it. I think it's, it's just good. It is. Um, and it covers so many things like it's just so good. It even covers, you know, it even covers the, um, the higher educational system when you're trying yes. to, you know, get in a program, you know, thrive in a program, mm-hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean that they really broke that piece down oh yeah Dr. Whitcomb he really broke that down to Ailey yeah 
So I would say, you know, I know, I know some of you will see a chunky book and just run the other way, but um, don't, don't. You it's should, worth it. This, oh it's, oh, it's so worth it. So worth it. Trust us when we say you will be carried away by a beautifully written story. And mm -hmm. is it hard sometimes? Is it heartbreaking yes. sometimes? Yes. Absolutely. But there are pockets of joy in the story as well. But isn't that life? Exactly. Exactly. Just give yeah. it a chance. Give it a chance. Yeah. Don't be afraid by the size of it. You know? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Don't be afraid by the size of it. It's it's a wonderful read. I, I'm going to be curious to see how many times this book gets, you know, long listed for various awards. I hope it does. I hope I it gets wonder, a lot of this, awards. Do you think this is Pulitzer worthy? I mean, well, I they would go give for it the a great Pulitzer. American sagas, sagas, don't they? I would go for a Pulitzer, but I'm not in charge of that. <laughs> I, I'm so curious. I'm, I'm going to be keeping my eye on this book. I just, I just want to see. Oh, all speaking the of amazing books that deserve all of the um, accolades and awards, we both had a moment where we were like. This reminds me of The Prophet. Yes. And I just feel like we haven't mentioned The Prophets in a couple episodes, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a good book pairing, don't you think? It is. It Maybe feels start with the like, prophet. yeah, it feels like almost the continuation of a narrative. Um, and it has this flow of back and forth in time and place that that is in The Prophets as well. And I just, I just thought it was. Yeah. They just, it reminded me. Yeah. And, remind, and you yelled at me and said it reminded you too and get yeah. it out of your head. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good book pairing. Yeah. Good read book Read The pairing. Prophets and then read The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm hmm And give yourself a big hug after. Yes. <laughs> Have a cup of tea. Yeah. Yeah. And a cookie because you're going to need it. <laughs> you're going to need it. You're going to need yeah. it. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Is it book so, recommendation time? It is book recommendation time. One day you we know. need to make a jingle. You oh, want me should. to go? Yes, because you don't have one? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so uh, I made a, a last minute swap out so I could talk about The Angel of Greenwood by um, Randy Pink because I saw somebody talking about it again on Bookstagram over the weekend. And I was like, that's right. This book's amazing. And more people need to read about it and talk about it. So this is a YA book that talks about the Tulsa massacre. And it is phenomenally well done. And it is incredibly moving. And actually pairs really nicely with the love songs of W.E.D. Du Bois. Because mm -hmm. the, the girl and the boy in this story go back and forth a lot between who 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 is the better you know, like black icon, is it Du Bois or is it oh, Booker yes. T? And that debate carries throughout the story. Also, it highlights that terrible, terrible moment in our history. Um, and if you don't know anything about, about um, the Tulsa massacre, you, you should, you should you read this. <laughs> it's very palatable. And, and is beautifully, beautifully written. And I just, I just love this so much. All right. I'm going to take the easy way out for this one. And I'm just going, because I just finished. Which, which book was that? I just finished. I just finished book five in the Expanse series. <laughs> book five is Nemesis Games. <laughs> I don't care. I don't you, care, man. I love this you series. Out. I love the series you so much. Out. I'm, I'm doing out. it. I'm doing it. Listen. My copy arrives today, I think. I love me some sci-fi. I love a good space opera. I'm going to say it again. The Expanse series is such a great, fun sci-fi series to read. You will not regret it. I love Holden. I love Naomi. I love Amos. I, I love them all. I love Alex. I love the, Amos so much. The crew is so wonderful. He's like a lovable, I don't know, mercenary. Like, he's just... Right. I love him so much. Right. And so, like, every book they're tackling a new issue and, you know, the stakes are always so high, but I think it's a great sci-fi series. I cannot wait... Well, 
I can't wait to finish because I want to watch the series, but at the same time, I'm sad to finish the series because I'm going to be very, you know, I'm going to miss it when it's over. I'm going to miss it when there's no more. But then there's the TV read. show. I know, but like, I love reading the books so much. So you can just read them again. I'm re- I could. I mean, hell, I read Leviathan Wakes, what, two, three times, Caliban's War two times. Uh, so, yes, I'm recommending the Expanse series. Again, to everyone. To everyone. <laughs> All right. All right, that's going to wrap right. up for us. Yep. I got to go to the bathroom. I got to blow <laughs> my nose. We're out of here. <laughs> bye. Bye. That was our best bye. <laughs>